Welcome. I'm Ned Benton, the chair of the IKEA Council, and, and uh, with Glenn Corbett, the executive, the, the director, and Ch Charles Jennings, one of our board members, who's a faculty member, I want to welcome you to an Academy for Critical Incident event, which is um, uh, Dave Cullen's talk about his new book. The Academy for Critical Incident Analysis at John Jay studies incidents, um, particularly, you know, incidents like Columbine, like Katrina, like um, uh, various uh, shootings, um, because life goes on in society and then there's an irregular, horrible event. And these events shape our culture. They shape how we see each other. They shape our fears. They shape our, our they have all kinds of ripple effects all over, uh, all over our culture. And when we first started studying incidents, I tended to think of the study of incidents as studying what happens during the incident. You know, what did the incident manager do and what was sort of the tick tock and the sequence of things that happened and were mistakes made and so on. But um, in one of our early um, studies of the uh, uh, Virginia Tech shooting, um, we focused on the aftermath of incidents. And one of the, uh, one of the studies that we, uh, we explored was one that, that examined the difference between students at the campus who saw the incident and were affected by the incident, who stayed on campus and those who went home to be with their parents. And there were much higher levels of PTSD among those who went home to be with their parents because their parents didn't understand them and because they got to watch the incident as a series of cable television replays. Whereas the students who stayed got together and talked about the incident and tried to do things about the campus and tried to do things for the community and for the families of, of survivors and families of people who had been lost. And those students had a better understanding of themselves and their, and their situation than the ones who went home. Another one we studied, again looking at the, the consequences, the, uh, uh, the aftermath, was Katrina, where after the flood, the so-called survivors of the flood, the people who lived in the flooded homes, were then randomly assigned to buses and sent to live all over the country until somehow Katrina could be pumped out and rebuilt and various kinds of things would happen. And so you took people who were injured in the incident because they, people died and, and, um, and, and their homes were destroyed. But then we separated them from, like if you have a strong church community, people, you know, the, the, the minister was sent here and some of the members who really needed the minister most were sent here, here, and here. The whole community was, was disrupted and so the aftermath consequences of the incident were magnified by how it was handled. Um, and then we see more recent incidents where people have gathered after the incident to try and do something about advocacy, um, about why we have guns, why we have all of these, these problems. And um, I think Dave Cullen's book is, is right it, it, it's because it's studying the survivors, he's really focused on this question about what happens afterwards. You know, the meaning of survivors, it's like this incident happened and f so many, you know, 10 people, 20 people were killed and the rest survived, like they're going to go home and watch television and then go to a baseball game. They are injured too. And uh, we, we really need to, to learn about how to help people survive these kinds of incidents, um, which affect them in so many ways for the rest of their lives. So uh, I really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for Dave. I'm excited for his book, which is now on the New York Times bestseller list. And I'm excited for us because we get to talk with him about his book. So Dave, 
With no more, welcome to John Jay. Thank you very much, and it's good to be here. And that the Virginia Tech study, um, I, was, I was at that conference at Virginia Tech with you all, which I think that was maybe when I first got started working with you all, I think. Um, and I was actually in Parkland on this Saturday, uh, meeting with a bunch of the moms of about a dozen of the March for Our Lives kids. Uh, I was there for a book uh, festival, and uh, one of the moms of the kid, one of, two of the kids in the book, uh, Daniel Duff's mom, I uh, asked if I wanted to go to lunch and just relax with them, and did I want a few of the other moms to come, or the other families, and about a dozen of them showed up. And I told them about the Virginia Tech study, and uh, they were stunned, um, but th they found that very comforting, because uh, they immediately said how all of their kids really got comfort from each other. And that was such a powerful, kind of unexpected healing factor for them, which, um, there's data to support that, but they really saw that close up. That they were initially extremely worried about their kids taking all this on at the worst possible moment of their lives, right? When their kids were in real uh, mental health trouble and then took on this huge project and were getting death threats within the first week and being accused of being crisis actors and pawns of who knows what, of Hillary's people or Obama's people or the DNC and so forth. Um, and they, they were afraid that that was really dangerous. And it never occurred to them that that also might be very, very healing and actually beneficial to them. Um, and they had seen that, but when they heard about the study, they were like, wow, that's exactly, you know, on a very smaller uh, group, they found each other. And they had the 25 of each other. There's about 25 kids in the group. Um, so let me back up. I just wanted to talk about that specifically, because um, I don't think I had even told any of you that. Well, that just happened Saturday. Um, so uh, <laughs> I had a question, which I think the answer is going to be for that I expected. But how many people were here, were alive in 1999 on April 20th? Okay, most of you, not some of you. It's a sort of an older crowd that I was expecting. Uh, so some of you before you were born, and the rest of you, you remember very vividly uh, where you were. I was in Denver, and I was just turning on the local news, um, just sitting down for lunch. Uh, right as the first reports were coming in of shots being fired, and no reports of injuries yet. Um, so I thought, oh, it's probably nothing. Um, but I had done one recent journalism story in the past, actually in the past 20 years, for Salon, which was then a really good website out of San Francisco. And I left an apologetic voicemail on my editor's uh, voicemail, Joan Walsh, saying, there's been a shooting outside Denver at a school. It's probably nothing. Um, I'm going to go up there just in case, in case it turns into something, and then I can worry if you want one. And um, of course, it was the horror that none of us were expecting. Um, and I did not know for a year that uh, I decided until a year out that I was going to do a book. By the way, is this going in and out? Is this OK? Or is it a little bit? Should I try the other one? Um, OK. so. Um, yeah, I didn't know what that was going to be, and America had no idea that something that now I refer to as the school shooter era was starting. And we didn't really realize that for quite a while, the ramifications of Columbine, and that all these other perpetrators would be modeling themselves after Eric and Dylan and writing about it in their, uh, in their I don't even want to call them manifestos, but uh, whatever we want to call them. Um, but so it was, it was a year before I decided to do a book about it. Actually, John Carp at Random House asked me to. Um, but before then, I knew I was going to be on the story for quite a while, and it wasn't really so much about that first day. It was, is it doing it again? Uh, let me just try to keep it right here and see how this works. Um, I'll try a little more discipline. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so it, it wasn't so much about the first day out there. It was the second day. Because the first day out there was exactly like what you would expect. It was chaos, pandemonium, sobbing, crying, people running for their children, just grabbing each other and just holding on for dear life. The second day was completely different. And no tears, almost no emoting. The kids all had this blank look on their face, or blank affect, as psychologists describe it. Um, and that really shook me up. It really scared me. 
And it took me a little while to figure out how to ask the kids about it, um, because I didn't want to be the dick reporter being like, oh, how come you're acting? Um, So after a few minutes, I figured out the the kids were mostly moving in packs. And so I I asked one of the groups of boys, I noticed those boys over there uh, weren't really crying anymore today, like yesterday. And they were like, I know, I'm not either. And so it totally worked. And um, but they did want to talk about it. In fact, they want to talk about it to any adult. And by the way, they had all fled their homes because the first afternoon, um, they all just wanted to see their moms and dads and just be hugged for dear life. By morning, they already wanted to get the hell out of there because their moms, and to some extent the dads, but especially the moms, wanted to just hug them continuously and check every five minutes. Are you okay? Do you need something? Can I make your favorite meal? Can I do this? Can I do that? No, I don't need it. I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, and until they just like, all ran from their houses. Um, which, by the way, was very, very hard for the moms. I mean, a lot of the griefing process is sort of unexpected things, and it's, that was a key one, that the moms really wanted to help their kids, and the kids really needed their parents to back off. Um, and neither of them kind of knew how to bridge that gap. And again, so they found each other. And the kids wanted to be with, with each other who did understand that. And that's, I think, probably a big really the biggest reason, I think, for the finding that was there, that um, parents, neighbors, it doesn't matter that your parents, anyone around does not know how to handle you and what you need. And the other people who are sort of bonded together as having gone through it do understand and know what you need to do and can help you appropriately and know when to back off, when to be close. Um, So that kind of freaked me out and that sent me, on a path that I had to figure, I had to find out what happened to those kids. Because I didn't really know if they were gonna be screwed up for life. You know, it was just kind of a lost generation of 2,000 kids. Um, so when I decided to do the book, it was about two things. Number one, the killers and why they did it. And number two, what became of those kids and how did they get through this? So that took me 10 years. And I suffered my own two bouts of secondary PTSD, one in the first year, and then one much later, seven years out. And that second one was really scary. And, um, and I made several um, agreements with my shrink, which included never going back to one of these again, and definitely never writing a book about it. And I was able to do things like go to the IKEA um, programs because they were usually a few years after. Actually, the Las Vegas one scared me a little bit because it was only, what, five months after or something, and that seemed a little close for me, but far enough. And I could also write, I often wrote about these people, especially the killers from a distance, so it had to be either in time or space, but I could not go anywhere near a fresh crime scene. And definitely, I didn't want to and saw no reason to write another book about about a murder, to write another true crime book, essentially, um, which I didn't. Um, this book is not about either of those topics. This is about the reaction to a crime. It is almost exclusively about the March for Our Lives kids and the other people in their orbit and how they responded to this. I refuse to even name the killer in this book, um, which got a little tricky in the uh, notes on sources in the bibliography where um, several of the you know, magazine and newspaper pieces that I cited um, named him in, in the headline. So, you know, we have these bibliography entries. What do we do? Just not uh, include them? So it really wasn't that hard. We just replaced his name by brackets, the killer. Um, and we figured anybody who's using this for research can figure that out and Google it, Google it themselves. And I'm sure Google will find it without that, those two words. Um, but he is never going to be in here. Which, by the way, it's, I did it for a lot of reasons, I, mainly because the, the killers, the, the way the media lionizes these, these killers and, 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 and is contributing to the project, which I've been railing about for years, um, which I think I first brought up in one of these groups, or maybe it was with Dr. Ockberg, um, at a journalism conference and nearly got booed off. Um, but the media is largely coming around. And partly, I did it as a demonstration project, too. If, if I can write an entire book about this and never mention the guy's name, and you probably wouldn't even notice it if I didn't tell you, you can't do that in your 1,200-word New York Times story or your one-hour TV show. Um, you know, you can call him the perp, the killer, the shooter, the murderer, the mass murderer the suspect, all kinds of different things, um, and nobody's confused about who you're talking about. Um, So, 
This time, I didn't plan to do it as a book. Uh, I definitely, once again, well, I wasn't ever allowed to go back there, but something interesting happened. Um, I become the mass murder guy on, on television and, and writing about after all these horrible events, which is sort of the most disgusting job, um, which, you know, we just sort of land in these things. Uh, but the morning after uh, Parkland, I was on New Day, <clears throat> and I was surprised to see Chris Cuomo there uh, to interview me, and I asked him about it, and I said, I thought you would be down in Parkland. Don't you always go to these things? And he said, um, I said, no. They were already booking my tickets, the travel and everything, and I said, I'm not going again. I've been there so many times. It's been going on 19 years. Nothing ever changes. It's just horrible, and I'm not doing it anymore. And I said, that's interesting, because I've been thinking about calling it quits, too, and just refusing to talk after these, and I think this is going to be my last time. And so I left there saying, this is probably it. And then, uh, you know, the universe likes to laugh at us when we say these things. And um, on the elevator down over Time Warner Center, just around the corner from here, um, they have uh, monitors on the elevator. And on the way down, I saw a young boy I'd never heard of before called David Hogg giving his first famous speech that you probably heard where he said, we are children, you are adults. And Basically, now I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you have failed us. You are letting us die, and you've done nothing. And wh what the hell, America? We need action. And I was just stunned. I'm like, and so I, by the way, I stayed on the elevator. It, it, I, I looked it up. It was, I believe it was an eight-minute uh, segment of him talking, and I just stayed on the elevator and watched the whole thing. I could not believe what I was hearing. And so I thought he was kind of a one-off, because this is this guy who just sort of jumped like eight stages of grief, and uh, first day survivors don't respond this way, but he was. And I got home, and there was one after another of them. And they weren't, nobody's, nobody's David Hogg. Nobody was, you know, as charismatic or articulate, but they were all saying versions of that. And I was like, wow, something is going on. So um, by noon that day, the morning after, I was writing a piece for, for Politico of, uh, is this time different? And if so, why? And as I was finishing up that weekend, a friend of mine, uh, I, I frequently write as a freelancer for Vanity Fair. My editor there called, and he knows me well, and he said, I know you're not allowed to go to one of these places, but would you think about going anyway? <laughs> and I said, oh, God. Uh, I, I was really kind of wanting to, so I said, let me think about it. And on Sunday, um, I said yes. I was on the phone with David Hogg, um, and he put me on the, the speakerphone with... The whole group from Cameron Kasky's living room, which I didn't realize it was at the time. Um, and the next day I was a on a plane and I was down there. And um, meanwhile, I, I, I didn't mention I spent the last 10 years working on this book on two gay soldiers that I've been researching since the year 2000. I've known these guys since then. And I was three years late on that. And I thought, also, I, I couldn't go down there because I had this book I had to finish. Um, and so I decided, and we agreed just five weeks. I was going to cover it five weeks, do several pieces for their website. And um, you know, quick dispatches up through the march, not a day more, and then back to the uh, the gay soldiers book. And I just wasn't going to tell my editor at Harper Collins, and hopefully she wouldn't you know read any of the pieces. Um, so that was the plan, which once again did not go according to plan. Um, I got down there and I was continually stunned by these kids, and and seeing so much more to the story than I was seeing on television. Um, and I will tell you the day that I didn't decide to write a book, but I had the first whiff that maybe there was a book here. Uh, it was 29 days out. It was March 14th, around 4 p.m. And uh, Jackie Corin, who's kind of the hero of this book, um, she's kind of the implementer who makes it all happen. You've probably never heard of, who's heard of Jackie Corin? Anyone? Just, <laughs> just Ned who's read the book. She's probably the most important character in March for Our Lives. And uh, I mean the book, but, but the... Uh, the, the movement she's sort of pretty much running at right now, um, which is part of what, <laughs> why I wanted to do something, because you know, these stories were not in the media. But uh, she got permission from the group to let me into their secret headquarters, which they weren't even telling the media existed because of the death threats and so forth. Um, which, yeah, by the way, I just said the sentence because of the death threats and so forth. <laughs> I mean, uh, the horror that we live in in that situation where that's you know, just an aside, oh, the death threats. Um, but they were really afraid for their lives. Um, 
But they let me in, they trusted me, and Jackie was showing me, you know, here's the room with the, the boardroom table, here's the back, here's the storage, we don't even use it for storage, it was here, uh, there's the writer's room, there's the bathroom, I'm like, oh, let me check out your bathroom. You would not believe how spotless it was. I could not believe, I'm really, um, and she said, oh, well, we try to, you know, treat it like a public bathroom, and I was like, exactly. <laughs> have, you, have you been to the gas station? Um, uh, bathrooms don't look like this, but um, they're well-behaved kids. Um, but, so, you know, she was telling me all these rooms, and she's like, there's the writer's room. And I'm thinking, the writer's room? But one of the things I do as a journalist is when I hear something that pings my ear, I typically don't say anything the first time because you don't want to throw a source and get them to be like, oh, well, maybe I wasn't supposed to say that. So I wait, and then um, I met Matt Deitch that day. Anybody heard of Matt Deitch? He's sort of the second most important. Uh, I got one, and also Ned, who read it. Uh, you already read the material. That doesn't count. Uh, right, yeah, you cheated. Um, and I met him that day, and, um, and I asked if I could interview. He said yes, and he said, well, let's go back in the writer's room. I was like, the writer's room? So then I said something. I'm like, the writer's room? And he looks right at me, and he goes, what, do you think this stuff's writing itself? And I was like, oh. Because I had seen their really, their great tweets consistently, these amazing, clever things, the memes, they do these little videos, and like, oh, you're not just like whipping those out like you see a tweet and like, you know, typing in, immediately responding. You're working on it. They're working on materials. And the more that I got to know them, it was like an SNL writer's room back there where they were like scripting stuff, bouncing it off each other. One of the, the biggest memes, they brought in equipment, Emma held the boom. They're, you know, they're responding to the NRA, who's something called, which has something called NRA TV. They have a studio. They have staff writing these. They need to respond in the same way. And one of the reasons these kids are so successful is because they've got a, a pool of about 25 really talented people all working together who are doing this stuff. Um, so when I decided to do the book, I did want to, uh, so who's heard of, uh, who can name some of the March for Our Lives kids? Anybody? Throw out a name. Any of the kids? Well, I mentioned David Hogg. Who knows who David Hogg is? Who heard of him before I said his name here? Most of you. What about, can you name any other ones? Anybody? Don't be shy, go ahead. Emma Gonzalez, that's the one I was going for. Who's heard of Emma Gonzalez? Probably almost everyone. Believe me, I've been doing interviews with Wellington, uh, New Zealand, in Australia. Everybody in the world knows who Emma Gonzalez is and David Hogg. Um, I was saying, you know, I was using their names and saying, do you guys know? And, and they, every time I do that, they're like, of course, of course we know who Emma Gonzalez is. I'm like, okay. Um, they, these people are known everywhere in South Africa. Um, so, but who can name anybody else? So this book, um, Emma and David are in there, and they're, they're featured, but I wanted to write about all the people who you don't know, that you haven't met, but that you would want to, and afterwards you'll be really excited that you did. Um, another particular group in here is um, the Peace Warriors, which are a group from, not the south side of Chicago, but the west side of Chicago, which, by the way, you've heard about all the murders happening in the south side of Chicago. It's not just the south side. It's big chunks of the west side, too. Um, so these kids at North Lawndale, a uh, heavily African-American school, um, have this amazing group uh, responding to gangs and, and to gun violence and working at it in their schools, but they have never gotten any kind of uh, resources, anything. In fact, they were invited... Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but they were invited to the March for Our Lives speech in Washington. Who remembers during that speech, two black kids from Chicago came out with neon duct tape over their mouths? One of them had orange duct tape, the other one had green duct tape. That was Alice King and D'Angelo McDade from the Peace Warriors from Chicago. The reason they had that duct tape over their mouth was they ripped it off and they gave their speeches and they said, everything I'm telling you right now, we have been saying for years. We have been trying to say it to the media. No one has been listening. You have not heard our voices. We have, heard, we have had no voice. Um, and we do today. And, and they've been equal par partners with the, the March for Our Lives kids. And the reason that came about, um, and I'm going to wrap this up and take questions, so think about your questions after this little bit. Um, the reason that came about was even before Parkland happened, the, the Parkland kids felt really awful that every time there's a school shooting, it's usually affluent suburban white kids, and America quakes and goes crazy. 
And we should be horrified by that. But meanwhile, 10 times as many black and brown and other kids of color are dying in America from gun violence compared to white kids. They're 10 times, 10 times more likely to die. Uh, or actually, I believe it's 10 times more of them die. And because of the share of the population, it's, their likelihood is much higher than that. Yet, we kind of shrug. And we hear about that occasionally, but not much. Not much attention on it. And the Parkland kids, before it happened to them, already thought that was kind of awful. And the day it happened to them decided this was going to be not just about school shootings and not just suburban violence, but gun violence against all young people in America of every color. And so they didn't want to be the white saviors and just come up with some you know, way to help black kids. They wanted to do it with those kids from those neighborhoods. And they wanted to do it with kids who were succeeding in their schools beyond all odds. Um, and so uh, something was arranged through, actually was Father Flager in Chicago was called upon and said, yeah, I know the kids. And he brought kids from the Brave program and uh, the Peace Warriors from two different high schools and um, you know, said, can we send them down to Florida? The Parkland kids said, yes. This was coming together on a Friday night and the Parkland kids said, can we do it tomorrow? Because it was already two weeks out and all the kids from all three high schools are, are in school. You know, they have to do it on a weekend. Um, so it was two weeks out. They didn't want to wait three. So the very next morning, those kids from Chicago were on a plane and came down to Emma Gonzalez's house. They all met at her house and shared their stories and started learning about the different uh, issues and what it was like, the different kinds of violence they were living through and how they could sort of start to figure this out. And they took a lot of breaks because it was pretty horrible, uh, you know, all sharing their different stories of how they were shot at. The, most of the Chicago kids had been shot at many times and lost family members and so forth. Um, and so during one of the breaks, uh, Emma was talking to D'Angelo McDade, who's the head of the Peace Warriors, and um, she was talking about what I talked about at the very beginning, what Ned talked about, is that... Um, in a way, this, working on this actually sort of also feels like it's kind of healing us. And he said, that sounds familiar. And he'd been looking at it for a moment to do this. So he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a dog tag. It was a colored dog tag and it had the number, I believe, yeah, the number four on it and it was blue. And it just had a peace symbol and the words principal number four. And, um, and it said on it, oh, sorry, it didn't say anything more than that, uh, but he explained what that stood for. It was, principle number four stood for Martin Luther King's fourth principle of nonviolence, which reads, suffering can educate and transform. And he had already figured that out, that what they were going through, channeled properly, could actually, could actually help you and educate and, and transform the world. And that's what was happening with them. And he started ta telling her more about the principles and she said, wow, this is great. Can we do it, the whole group? So they ended, the, uh, ended that, got, the, got everyone together and they had six of these in different colors for everybody in the group and passed them around and taught them about the six principles. And that really became the bedrock of how the March for Our Lives kids, um, how, how they led their movement. Um, and, and it was really the first time, too, that they saw, wow, we're a part of something bigger here that's been going on a long time. And the, the most important one is principle number two for them. And it was also sometimes the hardest to live by. But principle number two um, is nonviolence seeks to defeat in, injustice, not people. And Cameron Caskey, who pulled the group together, realized that he had failed on... Um, number two in that first town hall meeting um, on CNN about a week out. Do you remember that where Marco Rubio just kind of looked like a complete idiot? Um, who remembers Marco Rubio in that town hall? Um, and Cameron just kept hammering him, are you willing to, are you gonna keep taking money from the NRA? And Marco kept kind of trying to change the subject and deflect and Cameron just stayed on it like, yes or no, are you taking money? Are you taking money? Are you taking money? Are you gonna stop? And Marco was just hemming and hawing and looked ridiculous. And, and Cameron said later that he, he actually intended to make an ass out of him and try to do that. Um, and that was wrong. And that's violating that first principle, which is that um, even when somebody is, um, is behind the injustice, 
and is making it happen and doing it, that person is not your enemy. The injustice is and the system is. And you need to attack the system and what's causing it and not the human being. And every time you attack the human being and make them feel little or berate them or do anything against them personally, you are losing part of yourself and you are losing the battle. Um, and the kids were kind of amazed by that. And not only, you know, if they had already been fumbling for, for how they should conduct themselves and when they, you know, when they should be take on a, a, a politician and play hardball and when not. Um, and they realized this, this is exactly what we were looking for. And not only are these what worked in the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King went to India uh, early on to visit with Gandhi and to see what, you know, to get his ideas and what had worked with the British Empire. And these are ideas that have been cultivated for more than a century, and I'm sure, I'm not an expert on this, I'm sure Gandhi did his research and looked back much further than that. And they said, wow, we don't need to recreate the, I, the wheel. We love these six principles, and this is what we're gonna live by. And they don't always live up to it. David Hogg, in particular, really struggles with principle number two. If you've seen him tweeting, and somebody gets really dickish out there, he lashes back. Um, so they don't always succeed, but that's, that's the goal they tried to live by. Um, that's sort of the model, the aspiration, and, um, and try to work toward it. Um, so I'm gonna stop there um, and take some questions and see what you're interested in. So who has got one, so don't be shy? Following a number of incidents, we've had families, we've had um, groups attempting to try to do something um, that might have rolled out the way. Sure, these, I think I know where and, you're going. Why, why did this one work and all those fail? Well, was it, yeah, was it, was it something uh, about their talent? I got their it, charisma, I got it. Or was it something, I mean, if you're not so, t I mean, anyway. Okay, so it was really a perfect storm of factors. I can give you about the top 10, but I'm gonna give you the top three, which are kind of uh, over and above. Um, number one, a sense of urgency. They started day one. And when David Hogg did that famous speech, that was within 24 hours. And that wasn't the first time he said it, but that's the first time it sort of went viral. So uh, immediate. See, um, you know, after Newtown, which was sort of like going to be the one that finally worked, it was about a month before President Obama, you know, proposed this stuff. That that was too long. Um, we talk about the outrage dying, but if we talk about it more, well, we could talk about the outrage dying, and there's another factor there as well. So that is crucial. They did it urgency, urgently. Number two is the timing, and I made that in a different sense of the timing before. There was already something in America called the resistance which tells you so much that the, the tinder was there ready to be lit. There was, people were so angry and wanted to push back about the Trump situation, but even before that, the fact that, you know, Congress is, I don't know, what's the latest, their approval rating of 10% or 15, or it, it's been in the doghouse for a generation. People are disgusted with politicians on both sides who just, the whole, our era of spin and bullshitting and, um, no one respects them. We have completely lost respect for our politicians because they quit earning our respect a long time ago. Um, so we were ready for something. And the name the resistance is, tells you everything because you know, if it was about global warming or if it was about peace or you know, income inequality, it would be called that. You know, this was a resistance it's against. So we were ready for something, but we didn't know what. There was no agenda and there was no champion. You know, the best we had on the other side, um, Barack Obama had sort of gone into hiding for a while, as he probably needed to do. Uh, we had Chuck and Nancy, who are both very good at their particular jobs, but they're not charismatic figures. They're never going to lead an uprising. No one's ever going to follow either of those two people into battle, especially Chuck. Um, so there was no agenda and there was no, there was no champion. Um, they stepped up and they said, you know, it could have been global warming, it could have been all sorts of things. If somebody could punch through, but they stepped up, and this is a horror show that we know needed a solution, and somebody said, this is what we're gonna do, follow us, and we're ready to follow. So the environment was, was ripe. Um, and I think when you look at anything through history, whether it's the French Revolution or anything, it's, there was a moment. Something could happen, somebody stepped up, and bam, it did. Um, and, but number three, and the biggest of all, was the messenger. 
we had been trying for many years as, uh, for victims' parents, uh, survivors' parents, to be the face of this. And uh, particularly at Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook was a combination of that and politicians. We had Barack Obama, the most charismatic president in, uh, in a generation. Uh, the State of the Union address, what could be better than that? The most powerful man in the world behind it. Well, and, you know, and assisted by the families. No, it wasn't about logic, and it definitely wasn't about a politician. In our tribal setup, where now everyone sort of is against the other side, so half of America is against you if a politician does it, that wasn't going to work. And parents, we thought parents are such powerful figures because we all see these moms and dads in TV, and it's, it's horrible, and we feel pain, sadness, maybe outrage, uh, incredible compassion for these people. We don't feel fear. And I mean fear in the sense of fearing for that person's life. We don't see a Newtown mom on TV. Who has seen a Newtown mom and pictured an AR-15 pointed at her head and somebody blowing her brains out? Anybody had that reaction when they see these moms on TV? Nobody does. When you see David Hogg or Emma Gonzalez or any of those kids, you may not picture it literally, but I think a shudder kind of goes through you. That like, these are the faces of the targets. These are the targets speaking. And it's not just the past targets. They look like your kids. I, you know, I have six sisters. I have several siblings. When they sit, you know, two of them have kids that are three years old, and they're getting to the point where they're going to have to send them to kindergarten. Every mom I talk to sending their kids to school for the first time shudders to do it and feels this guilt and shame. Am I sending my kid off to a death chamber? It's dead kids walking and everybody who has kids in school and, and knows that horrible lockdown drills, and every time they go, oh, lockdown drills. Yeah, they're teaching you how to hide when somebody's there to murder you. Um, and that's, oh, that's a great, by the way, like, oh, they're gonna murder you. Okay, turn off the lights and lock the door. Okay, good strategy. I mean, better than nothing, but it's pitiful. So everybody in America sees those kids, and really, I think any 18-year-old kid who gets up and talks about this and just shudders, that these are the faces of the kids were going to get murdered unless we do something. We're letting our kids get murdered. And that was a game changer. They, they had to speak for themselves. And the Newtown kids were not old enough to speak for themselves, even their little brothers and sisters. They're finally getting old enough to. And way back, the Columbine kids had no idea they needed to. And they were in shock. They were in a whole different world. But um, yeah, it was, it was the messenger. That changed everything. And, and I think will. But all those factors, and, and several others too. But, um, that, that all came together. So who else? Just uh, thank you for writing the book. It, it oh, sounds sure, like you, you took it in a direction that is uh, constructive and positive and, and healing. And I know uh, you'd, you'd spoken about that before the book had come out. And it's, it's great to hear, uh, hear you uh, talking about it some more. Uh, I was just wondering uh, what your thoughts were on uh, kind of the division of, of effort in terms of, I guess, activism around the, um, you know, the, the gun agenda or the gun control agenda versus kind of the backward looking or the recriminations. And, you know, I know in Florida there are, I think, three separate investigations going on into the shooting itself. Um, and it's kind of, you know, all the recrimination and all the things that have come out in the press the, of, you know, kind of outright incompetence in terms of how that was managed and, and if that, how that kind of uh, kicked around or did it, did it have a role in, in, in this at all or inform that? No, this did not, that did not have any role in this book. I did not read the report. I've heard the stories, um, but I decided, well, first of all, it was nearly impossible to write and report a book within a year. And my last, de I got the, my last changes on December uh, 17th, so I had 10 months to do it. Um, and I had no time to deal with anything else except focus on those kids. And I didn't really want to. Um, I wanted this focus to be on the reaction and really to parallel what the kids were talking about. Um, because the kids privately are outraged and pissed by you know, their own killer and, and, and what was done and things that fell through the cracks. But they're not talking about that. They do not want to focus on that because for many, many years, there have been, you know, there have been different ideas about how to end this blight of school shootings and mass murders. And the three biggies are mental health, which I think we should refer to really as teen depression and, and um, 
in identifying teen depression, but th that's one. Uh, number two is sort of the media's role in lionizing these and the no notoriety movement. No notoriety is the name of the movement. And number three is guns. And people are constantly opponents of any of these are using one of the other ones to deflect. So if you're against one, you just change the subject with the other ones. And of course, that's the NRA strategy. And a lot of people in Congress, oh, it's mental health, mental health, which first of all, the kids say like, oh, if it's mental health and you want to do something about mental health, where's your mental health plan? And where's your funding? Like, so great, do something about that. Um, so first of all, you're not serious if you're not doing anything on that. But number two, fine, go ahead and do that. We're not talking about that. They decided they had to keep the focus, pick one thing, the most important thing in their mind is guns, and it's guns, 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 and we're not going to let you change the subject at all. Talk about that all you want. Write all the stories you want. We're here to talk about guns. Don't try to change the subject on us. And that's why they've been very successful. And I decided to do the same thing. I'm staying on them. I'm staying on that issue. And sure, these other things should be dealt with and written about them, but that's not my topic. I'm not doing, I'm doing these kids. I got a question back here, Dave. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you handle your PTSD after you write the book. I know that you probably have some connection to the victims, the survivors, the families of both Columbine and Parkland, but how do you keep in touch or not keep in touch because you get so close to them after a while? Like, how do you separate from it and deal with it? Oh, well, that's really interesting. I, <laughs> I don't deal with it by separating. Um, so when la last summer I took two trips to Columbine, uh, well, spring and summer, uh, to cover the Parkland kids coming there, both times I spent most of the time staying at the houses of some of the Columbine survivors. Um, I know them that well now that they have me stay with them when I'm there. Um, I know, not obviously not all of them, but I know quite of them very well. Uh, we're sort of in this weird thing together. Um, Connie Sanders is the daughter of Dave Sanders, the one killer, who, or excuse me, teacher who died heroically at Columbine. Um, I introduced her to Sue Klebold, one of the killer's moms. And uh, they're good friends now. Um, that was only about two or three years ago. <clears throat> and um, the three of us have talked, and it's weird. We're, we're all in the same weird orbit of this, and could not be three weirder roles. Like, you know, the mom of one of the kids who did it, the daughter of one of the guys who died, and then, just, you know, the reporter who's been in there with them and all. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other people, EMTs, teachers, you know, ministers, all sorts of people thrown into this weird uh, mass murder orbit, and um, we're never getting out. Although I tell them all the time, of the three of us, I'm the only one who sort of did it by choice. So, like, uh, Connie had no choice of her dad getting killed, and, and you know, and I just lost her name. Was her, Sue, Sue, Sue had, you know, would change anything to have her son not murder these people. Um, but we're still in there. Um, and different roles, different effects on us, but um, we, we all have a, a part in this. And we're all sort of doing things. I mean, Sue wrote her book. She talks all the time um, at seminars and has become a big advocate for moms to understand depression and to recognize it. And um, Connie got her PhD in psycho psychology. And, um, and treats people involved in these sorts of situations, not what you might not expect, not like victims or people getting through it. She treats perpetrators, um, men, a lot of rapists, men who assault people. Um, she, you know, she says, I wanna help those fuckers who are doing it, help them stop doing it to more and, and doing it to more women and to other people. And you know, that's her take on it. And you know, be, it, because of this, because her dad died, caused her to do that. and. Um, she loves doing it. The, those guys drive her nuts sometimes, but she's really good with them. But so we're all in this weird thing. So yeah, so no, I, I, um, that would be one strategy of like, how do you leave it behind and get away from it? Oh, I don't. Um, I mean, go on and do other things and try to do other things. I spent the last 10 years on a completely different book on gay soldiers. But I'm still a part of it. Um, with, um, but, but because of it, I had to deal with the triggers and understand the triggers. And for me, um, I thought writing about the killers would really take me to a dark place the way I just immersed myself in their world for nearly a year. Um, didn't. Uh, it turned out the killers don't get inside me. It's like treating, you know, like studying a, a disease under a microscope. It doesn't really affect me. Uh, the, the survivors do. And that's, that's my poison. And uh, 
Every time one of these happens, I just hold the remote when I'm watching TV with my trigger thumb over the pause button or the mute, and any time they start showing or talking about, you know, Sarah, she was 17 and she liked, you know, sewing and needlepoint and blah, 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 I just have to stop that because I'm not allowed to hear that or, I mean, it seems cruel and kind of gave me permission to, you know, do this. They all did. It's like, uh, as soon as I start to see these survivors as human beings and with a life and uh, it just, it tears me up and uh, I can go to pieces. I'm just not allowed to do that. Um, and so that's how I, you know, deal with that. But after Parkland, it was completely different. So with Parkland, I thought I might really mess myself up and I, you know, might be creating, causing in for a huge mistake. In fact, the first night down there, I thought, what the hell am I doing? And um, when I got there, I had a little mini breakdown and thought I was going right back to that plane. Um, but it turned out it was okay. And in fact, it wasn't just okay. It, they really healed me. Um, I knew that I had trigger problems with PTSD. When something came up, I had to be careful. But just normal daily life, day to day, I thought that stuff was behind me in the cloud. I know I was under a black cloud while writing Columbine, but I really, it was like almost overnight when I finished. That had lifted and I thought that was behind me. I didn't realize how much it was still in me until, um, well, throughout the year I was noticing it. And when I was talking to Alfonso, one of the, the major kids in there who's just kind of delightful and hysterical, I was talking to him over Thanksgiving, over phone, for almost two hours, talking about things that had happened. I said, you know, he, he was going through kind of a rough patch. And um, I said, God, I hate to tell you this, it's sort of the opposite for me. Um, you know, I didn't even realize how still much sadness there was in me until this year. I'm like the happy, silly, fun Dave again, that the pre-Columbine Dave that I hadn't seen in 20 years. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was sort of, <laughs> that was an unlikely fringe benefit that just being around them, uh, their hope, their joy, and just their, their wisdom, their amazing, what they're doing, they're just going after it. That just really, and, and finally finding, a, a hopefully, a, a way out of this uh, changed me for the better. So that really healed me. So this time I don't have a problem. I have the reverse. I have a solution I, for me personally. So I, I'm, I'm doing great now. Um, and, and occasionally it's, it's still sad. Well, the, the anniversary week was really sad. And it was harder being at a distance. I was texting a whole bunch of them, um, especially a lot of the moms, and God, everybody's having the worst freaking week. And then I talked to Matt Deitch. Uh, we just missed each other in DC, I guess last week, about 10 days ago. Um, I was flying in as he was flying out. I can't even remember now, because uh, uh, I've just been running around everywhere, and so are they still. Um, but he was having a really bad day, and I asked why. And he said, Ugh, it's just one anniversary after another. He's like, three days ago was Joaquin's, uh, the anniversary of his funeral, and I remember where I was that day. And then this particular day, it was a, it was a weird, it was the one year of something in particular. Um, and then, uh, wait, was, is that Wednesday today? Wait, what is it, is today Wednesday? Oh, tomorrow, today's a Tuesday. Sorry, I've been flying around. I have no weekend, so I can't keep track of what day it is. That's tomorrow. Um, tomorrow's gonna be a tough day because I'd forgotten, um, it happened on Valentine's Day, which was also Ash Wednesday. And so they already went through the, the Valentine's Day anniversary, but tomorrow, especially for the ones who are Catholics, um, that's gonna trigger. It's, you know, it's Ash Wednesday again. Um, all these things, ugh. Um, so when I saw them, um, that was hard. It was really helpful to go down there again. Uh, Joaquin Oliver, uh, uh, his, his parents, uh, Manuel and uh, Patricia, they're the ones who do the change the rough thing and do the big murals, the artists, I don't know if you've seen, and the guy who almost got thrown out of Congress a few weeks ago. Um, they're really kind of wonderful. And I had done Christian Amanpour's show with them, but via satellite and on the anniversary. And I thought Patricia, who I hadn't seen in, in three or four months, just looked like she just wanted to curl up and die. It was just horrible. And my heart was breaking. and I. I didn't know how to help her and wondering, you know, if she'd, if she'd really regressed and was really that bad. So this past week I was in Miami and then Broward and they actually introduced me at the 
event in Miami and we had um, coffee first and she came over and hugged me and they were smiling and laughing and making jokes. I'm like, oh, you're okay. Um, and you know, then they talked, actually they had a really rough day with, uh, well, I don't want to say on film, but uh, they had a rough day with something going on that day, but they were still, they were okay. They were getting through it. And just to see them and then to see all the moms on Saturday, it's, uh, it helps to see them and to know they're going to be okay. Um, and they're not a wreck. They're, a lot of them are struggling in different ways, but, but getting through it. And um, that's really reassuring. Um, I need to go back there more often just to sort of be reassured. Yes, because um, a lot of rough things are going down down there, but they're, most of them are getting, are getting through it. So that helps. Any other questions? Okay. Ned, uh, Ned's got a point. And by the way, when Ned's coming up, uh, we do have books back here. The wonderful Gigi's here. Uh, to sell books, they're thirty dollars, so um, it would be available. And Dave is uh, wonderfully going to sign them for you if you'd like one. So yeah, and you can do selfies if you want to, or anything like that. Post. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Um, you write about twenty-five kids, and I wonder if the the next three hundred kids. I mean, there's thousands of kids. Um, how? Whether you have a sense of how the the rest of the kids are doing that have not had the ability to engage in this particular uh, small group. You mean from Marjorie Stillman Douglas yes. High School? Yes. Um, I don't completely know. I mean, I, I know mostly from uh, re media reports and from talking to them. Um, it's a rough period right now, you know, where you're at, which some of you guys know, which is, I mean, this is kind of the time when a lot of communities turn on each other and um, there's a lot of infighting. There's a lot of that going down on right now. Um, the superintendent has become sort of a proxy uh, war and people are picking sides. Some people want him, I think it's a man, want him out. Uh, other people think it's, you know, it's doing a great job and that's one awful thing that happened. Um, and I heard all sorts of stories about, you know, people picking sides and then doing horrible things to people on the other side. Um, God, what else? Um, the cover, I'm really shocked they're covering the, the story constantly down there, and that is really infuriating people that can't get away from it. Um, so there's a lot of struggling. It's a rough time right now. Um, uh, I haven't, uh, yeah, they seem to be getting through it, but I don't, uh, I, I did not follow that closely. I don't have enough great data to give really a good answer on that. Um, yeah, I, I haven't gotten a sense that there's sort of anything out of the ordinary that's most worse than most of these. But but my focus was mainly on those kids, and 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 I kept it there. And and by the way, just to clarify too, I mean it's about 25, and it's about what they did as a group. But then I I feature uh, there's about six of the March for Our Lives kids, and then a few of the outside ones, and occasionally other ones come in. Um, because with all you know storytelling, um, it's all about your character selection, and then. Stick into a handful, because if I did 25 kids, you would have, you would confuse them all. Nobody could keep 25 characters. God, okay. Anna Karenina, you know, I don't even think had quite that many characters, and I like had the list and like you know notes on what they all, had. you know, Tolstoy is famous for driving you nuts with that many characters. But um, so I had to, you know, pick a handful, um, and I tried to pick people in different kind of roles um, and different perspectives um, to sort of stand in for the whole group. Anybody else want to do one more? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, here you go. Behind you, he's got one. And we can do one more after this if everybody has one. So like, last chance, think of your question. And go ahead. Um, so I wanted to touch on one of the things you mentioned. So you talked about how during the um, town hall meeting with uh, Marco Rubio, um, how I forgot the name of the kid, but they kept like asking him about like the NRA funding. Cameron, um, yeah, Cameron yes. Kesky. And yeah. you mentioned how like, um, they violated one of the principles, per se, of like what they wanted to be following. Um, well, they hadn't, yeah, this is before they had those, right, but yeah, right. but yeah. yeah. Um, and you mentioned how the reason that he was, they were thinking about this was because um, going after an individual such as Marco Rubio wasn't like beneficial to fighting like the injustice of the system. But my question was, um, he is a politician per se, and if the politicians are representatives of both like these citizens of the U.S. as well as like representatives of the government, then 
as those representing it, were, aren't they the correct people to go after in the sense of like fighting the system that is perpetrating the injustice? Because if not, who would you be um, demanding answers from? Well, according to Martin Luther King, no, never any person. Not personally. You can go over what they're doing, what they're saying. Um, I need to research this more. I have a feel. Yeah, I better be careful. Does anybody know? I have a feeling he meant even like slave owners you shouldn't attack. It's sort of like as a human being. Um, yeah, that, that's this principle that it's like uh, attack what they're doing, but if you belittle the human being, um, you lose a part of yourself and that you, you don't get anywhere by doing that. Um, and you undermine your own credibility all, for all sorts of reasons. But he said, keep your eye on what, you know, attack, Mar and, and, and definitely, yes, you should be like holding Marco Rubio's feet to the fire about NRI funding, but making him stammer, making him look like an idiot uh, should not be the goal. Um, and, you know, and then if he does that, you know, by himself, well, that, you know, that's not your fault if he, you know, sort of does become an idiot. But if you're pushing him and really hoping to catch him off, knock him off guard and stammer and look like a fool, um, if that was your goal and you succeeded, well, then that is, that is a problem. Um, you know, I think more in terms of, like, David and Laura Ingram. Um, and, you know, it, it's where, even with her, it, it's, so, I, okay, here's where I would, it's okay to then wage a boycott against Laura Ingram if that's your goal and that's the injustice. But um, not to, uh, you know, belittle her or, you know, make fun of her accent or the way she dresses or her breast size, which women do all the time, um, or people do with women on TV. Um, you know, a friend of mine, uh, Elise Jordan, um, is an MSNBC and NBC uh, political analyst. She's very good looking and she, She's well endowed, and every time she's on uh, any show, which is every day, um, somebody's attacking her on Twitter for, you know, oh, that chick, that blonde, and also she's blonde hair. That blonde chick with a big tits is blah, 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 like an idiot. It's like, she gets attacked every time, and you know, the first time I was like, she was talking to me about it, I was like, oh, you know how many times I've ever been attacked for my appearance when I've been on television? Zero. Nobody, you know, nobody ever says like, you know, like, I don't know, like, why has he got a whatever shaped face or like his hair is going gray or anything, anything. It's never happened to me. It still has it. And with her, it's every day. Um, so going after Laura Ingram for those kinds of things or, you know, just any kind of way to make her look like a fool um, would be violating uh, Martin Luther King's principles. But boycotting her for what she does and trying to get the show shut down if she's doing something, I would... I would think, you know, not that I'm an expert on his principles, but I think that's okay if that makes it clear to care, clarify what they're doing. Um, yeah, but, but not as a human being. Anybody else okay. before we wrap up? We're going to wrap up here. Any more questions? Okay. All right, well, let's have a round of applause for our speakers. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate you coming.